Take your Bibles and have them open with me to uh, Acts chapter 13. Uh, we're going to be there in, uh, in several moments. Um, I was going to look this up while Tyler was talking, but I was so enthralled. Okay, good. All right. So, uh, two weeks ago, uh, we started into a new series called Speak Jesus, Getting the Gospel Right. So, uh, I got to thinking about uh, 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 the second part of that, getting the gospel right. Uh, it sounds like it's a little presumptuous. Like, have we been getting the gospel wrong uh, all this time? And the answer is no. Like, we haven't been getting the gospel wrong. We've just been getting the gospel short. Like, we've been, we've been uh, often sharing an, an incomplete gospel. And, and so I've tried to say lots of times to us that the gospel is so much bigger than we ever talk about, so much bigger than we ever think. And so what I've been uh, uh, wanting to do for a very long time is um, to go through the book of Acts. So uh, Matt and, and, and Tyler were going through uh, parts of the book of Acts uh, during my absence, uh, and they took us like all the way up to, I don't know, Acts chapter 10 or 12 or somewhere around there. And uh, what I want to do is um, uh, pay attention to the preaching in the book of Acts, the preaching in the book of Acts. Like when, when the gospel was shared, what did they say? How did they articulate the gospel? And, and, and I think if you uh, would, would take your Bibles home and look at uh, all the different preaching events in the book of Acts, starting with Peter in Acts chapter 2, uh, you'll find like, oh, like the the gospel is so big, There's, there are, there are uh, like these all-encompassing pieces to it. So uh, two weeks ago, we um, uh, uh, looked at this incident that the apostle Peter had and, and talked about how it's, for, him, for, for, the, for the early church, uh, it was impossible for them not to speak the gospel. Like Peter said, like Peter and John were brought before the authorities and um, uh, they had, they had uh, a finger waved at them. And they said, now boys, like, we want you to quit doing that. We, we want you to quit speaking in the name of Jesus. Like, we can't have lame people at the temple healed every day. You've got to quit this. And so they got this really good finger shaking. And Peter said, um, you decide whether it's right for us to obey you or to obey God. As for us, and these were the great words, as for us, we cannot help but speaking Jesus. We cannot help but speaking what we have seen and heard. I don't know about you, but almost every day, almost every day, I, I, I figure out how not to. Every day I... I, I I know how not to speak Jesus. And so we asked this question two weeks ago. It, if you were commanded under, under threat of punishment, if you were commanded not to speak Jesus, would, would anything in your life change? Is there anything that you'd have to change? So last weekend... Uh, we had a great time. We had this team come in from Spirit and Truth. They're based in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, they came in for what we call a Holy Spirit weekend. Now, uh, uh, it had seemed to me that in, in, in the book of Acts, again, where we've been uh, hanging out for quite a long time, that in the book of Acts, when, whenever the Holy Spirit comes into a person, Jesus is what comes out. We're filled with the Spirit person in Acts is filled with the Spirit, and Jesus comes out. They speak Jesus. And so last weekend, we had uh, these wonderful people uh, from Spirit and Truth come, and, and, and we had an, an equipping session so that we might learn how to operate our, uh, our, our daily lives, that we might learn how to operate in step with the Spirit, and in so doing, that we might more regularly speak Jesus. So uh, for this whole series, uh, I've chosen uh, as a text 
Acts 5.42. This one verse, Acts 5.42. And in fact, what I'd love for you to do is uh, uh, to memorize this verse. Uh, you've got all summer to do it, so that's not so bad. But it would be wonderful if we memorize this verse. So would you do me a favor? Just indulge me or something. I don't know. You know, uh, I had open heart surgery. So <laughs> So, sorry. Uh, I want you to indulge me whether I did or not. And um, look, 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 look uh, at your message notes. And uh, uh, this, is, this is my own par- <laughs> This is my own paraphrase of this verse, all right? Uh, we'll see the real one in a, in, a, in a couple of moments. But this is my paraphrase of Acts 5:42. And so I want to read it, but I, I just I want you to answer after me, okay? This is the part I want you to indulge me in. Like, I know when I sit where you sit, I really hate it when preachers say, repeat after me. Um, but every once in a while, I still do it. So uh, uh, let, let, let's do it. I'll, 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 I'll say a piece, and then you, you answer. Are you ready? Okay. Every day, in church and in homes, they never stopped. Explaining and announcing the good news that Jesus is the world's one true king. Okay, awesome. You did that so great, I'm not even going to make you do it a second time. Um, uh, Katie, let, let's, let's see that verse in its context. So uh, a little while ago, uh, Matt preached from Acts chapter 5 and and so what's happened is uh, Peter and John have been brought before the Jewish authorities ag- again, like for a second time, and, and they were imprisoned, and they like, what are we going to do with these guys? Like, what are, what are we going to do with these guys? Like, we've, we've, we've punished them, we've commanded them, uh, um, and we put them in prison, and, and like somehow they got out, and um, uh, uh, so what are we going to do? And so uh, they had a little meeting about it, and like um, uh, one of the leaders, Gamaliel, said, uh, "You know what? Let's just let's just not uh, let's let's not press it." And so in Acts five forty, so I'm just going back one verse, uh, but I want that one to stay there. Um, he, uh, Gamaliel, uh, his speech persuaded them. Like let's leave them alone for now. Uh, I love this definition of leaving them alone, right? Like let's not do anything. So they called the apostles in and had them flogged. I, I don't know about you, but that, like, that's like, that's doing something. Like they're whipped. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them. Here it is again. They ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and, and let them go. With, with scars on their backs, they, they, they let them go. Now, in Acts 41... Uh, 541, the apostles left the Sanhedrin, that's the ruling body, rejoicing because they, I'd be smarting, but rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. 42, day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped. They never stopped. Despite jail, despite flogging, despite commands, despite lectures, despite finger wavings, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah, that is the world's one true king. Friends, that's the good news. That's the gospel. The gospel, this is your first fill-in, by the way, the gospel is all about Jesus. It's not about us. The gospel is about Jesus. Specifically, that Jesus is the king. Jesus is the king. That's the gospel. That's the gospel that that Jesus preached. The gospel of Mark. Here's the good news, said Jesus. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's right here. And, And he didn't say it. But it was implied and it's discovered later on. And and it's me. Like I'm bringing in the kingdom because I'm the king. The gospel is all about Jesus. That he is the king. He is the king. 
Well, this good news, this story about Jesus being the king has, has a backstory to it. Like Jesus didn't come in out of nowhere. It has a backstory. And the backstory has been all about the people of God waiting for a king, wanting a king, looking for a king. And, and Paul shows up, and he's in, uh, so now we're in Acts chapter 13. Uh, Peter is in this place uh, called, uh, now we're going to be confused here for a moment. Um, he's in a place called uh, Pisidian Antioch. Uh, so uh, there's two Antiochs that are really important in, 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 in the book of Acts. Uh, one of them is, is uh, are you ready? A Syrian Antioch, or the Antioch that uh, it's, where, it's where believers were first called Christians. It's uh, the Antioch church. It's kind of like in, in the Palestine area and uh, uh, close to Israel, like, but like we, Syria. Um, it's where the believers were first called Christians. Uh, it's the church from which Paul and, and his associate Barnabas were first sent out. Okay, So that's the first Antioch you read about in, in the book of Acts. But Pisidian Antioch, where he is now, it's, it's in Turkey. All right, So he's in Asia Minor. He's, he has uh, taken a boat and he's started to travel on this missionary journey. And so he, he's in Pisidian Antioch and he goes into the temple. He goes into the temple, or sorry, there's no temple there. He, he goes into the synagogue, all right, the Jewish gathering place for worship and teaching. He goes into the synagogue, which is where he went on every stop. And every stop, he started at the synagogue. So uh, in Acts 13, let's go. Um, oh, so here's his traveling plans, uh, Perga, Pisidian, Antioch. And on Sabbath day, uh, they entered the synagogue and sat down. Uh, after the reading from the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them, which Paul and, and his associates, saying, brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. So Paul is gathered with his people, and then he has this, this invitation uh, to share a word. And, and so he starts. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Fellow Israelites, boy, that's, those are the words I want you to circle, or highlight or underline. Fellow Israelites. Israelites, and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. Listen to me. So the backstory that Paul's about, and uh, the backstory that Paul's about to go through, and, and we're not going to we're not going to go through his entire message this morning. Hallelujah! Um, uh, but the backstory that he's about to go through uh, connects him with the people that he's gathered with. Like Paul is fitting in with this group in the synagogue. Like Paul and his associates, they were a part of this people, uh, fellow Israelites. You know, when, when, when some Christians try to share their faith, when some Christians uh, talk about God or try to talk about Jesus, like they, they almost come at it like they're from a different planet. You know, and, and people listen to them and like, what kind of alien are you? Like, you're, you're, just, you're just weird. And, and, and some Christians take pride in being recognized as, as being weird. But Paul is like, like look, there's nothing, there's nothing weird about me. I'm a, I'm a part of you. He says, fellow, fellow Israelites. Like we have this shared history. We have this shared backstory. The backstory unites us. That's actually your fill in. I'm sorry. The backstory unites us. This is who we are. We have this shared history together. When I was 15 years old, uh, I was a part of a mission team that would travel to different churches. And, and we would share our testimony. And we'd share our faith. And we'd stay for the weekend, Friday Friday, Saturday, and Sunday morning, uh, much like we did last weekend here. And, uh, and all we really did uh, was share our testimonies, share about our faith uh, in Jesus. And so I'm 15 years old. I'm a part of the youth team. And, 
uh, they have a church dinner, and, and so I go into the dinner. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know anybody, and so I go into the dinner, and, uh, and I sit down, and beside me uh, is another youth who's actually just a year younger than me. He was, he was I think, 14, and, and I don't know his name. I mean, he's from this church that we're visiting, and I, I, all I said was, hello, brother. Hello, brother. Now, here's the truth. Like, I don't, I don't remember saying that. Uh, I, I only know that I said that because that's his testimony. That weekend, that weekend, he surrendered his, his life to Jesus. That weekend, he, he became a Christian. And, and he said that what really got him was that, that I called him brother. Imagine that. Imagine that. Like, like I had him at brother. I didn't need to say anything else. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm a part of you. Uh, we we share, we share a backstory. So, Paul and his associates, they're asked to share a word. There's an invitation. There's there's receptivity, and when the opportunity presented itself, Paul had a message. He knew what he needed to say. And so here's how, here's how he starts out. So this is like the backstory. And what the backstory is going to do, I'll give you your fill-in, and then we'll show you how it works. Uh, the backstory displays God's actions. The backstory displays God's actions. So let's look at verses 16 to 20. Oh, there we are. Okay, and this is what I want you to pay attention to. I want you to pay, in these verses, I want you to pay attention to who is the actor? Who is, who is doing, who's, who's, who's the subject of all the verbs, all right? So listen to how it goes. Uh, so standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors, right? So we're, we're together in this. The God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. Do you hear it? Do you see it? Like, like, oh, no, go back. Um, there we go. Uh, God chose. God made them prosper. God led them out with mighty power. Now, now switch. So uh, he goes on to say, for about 40 years, God, again, he endured their conduct in the wilderness. And he overthrew seven nations in Canaan giving their land to his people as their inheritance. All of this took about 450 years. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel. All right, how many more things do you see God doing here? Uh, God endured their conduct. God overthrew seven nations. God gave the land to his people. Uh, uh, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. I've got seven verbs so far. Like seven things God's done during this history. Let's go to the next section. Then the people asked for a king. Oh, we finally have a verb where the people are doing something. Then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled for 40 years. After removing Saul, okay, so God's back on the acting here. After removing Saul, uh, God made David their king. Okay, it's no accident that we got the mention of two kings going on here. Because what's the good news? The good news is that Jesus is king. The good news never was that Saul was king. The good news never was that David was king. The good news is that Jesus is king. So uh, God testified concerning David, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to, except the sleeping with Bathsheba thing, and except the killing of Uriah thing, and except being on his deathbed and, and doing mafia-like conspiracy hits before he dies, all except that kind of stuff, right? Uh, but look, you see God acting some more. God acting some more. Last verse. From, from this man's descendants, that's David, from this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus, 
as he promised. The backstory has led to Jesus again and again and again. I'm reminding you of the words of um, the Bible Project uh, folks. That the Bible is, is a unified story leading to Jesus. The backstory has been a unified story leading to Jesus. Leading to Jesus. This is God's story. It's not, it's not our story. It's not about us. It's what God is doing. And, and God has been doing these things as a faithful God. We sang, great is thy faithfulness. Do you know that, that God was faithful all during that backstory amongst a very unfaithful people? Like one of the storylines of the Old Testament is just about the, the continuous repeating of the unfaithfulness of God's people. And of God looking for one to be faithful, which he found in Jesus. But all through the Old Testament, unfaithfulness. Sometimes a very ugly history. But God is faithful amongst an unfaithful people. So Paul goes through all of this. And uh, he goes through the backstory, which they know. Like, they know this story. Like they, they just read it again from the Law and the Prophets. The good news was that they didn't know was all of this history leads to Jesus. Because that's the, that's the gospel. That's the good news. Everything has led to Jesus as king. Everything has led to Jesus as king. Look, the backstory and even the telling of it reveals our needs and our longings. The backstory reveals our needs and our longings. Look at verses 24 and 25. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his work, he said, who, who do you think I am? Like, who do you suppose I am? I'm not, the one, I'm not the one you're looking for. Like nobody debated that they were looking for one. That they were waiting for a king. The backstory has always been about waiting for a king. And John the Baptist says, I'm not the one you're looking for. I'm not the one. But there is one coming after me whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. The backstory reveals our longings and our desires. We want a king. We need someone to come because we know that we are not where we want to be. Right? That's it right there. We are not where we want to be. The dreams, the ideals, we don't experience them. The things that we hope for have not been fulfilled yet. And it doesn't even matter how you spin the backstory. Like you can spin the backstory in a positive way or a negative way. It doesn't, doesn't even matter which way you go with it. Like like, like we do our, we have our own backstories and we spin them uh, our own particular ways. And so we might say uh, in the positive side, we need to go back to the good old days. Like that's a pretty prominent theme. We need to go back to the good old days. Or, or, or we, might, we might look at the good old days in more of a negative way and, and we might say better things are yet to come. Better things are yet to come. Like, so this, this longing that we have, this desire that we have for this, the world that we live in to be different than it is, right? and, and that's the longing. Like, th we're not where we want to be. Like, we know that something is amiss in our world. We know that it's broken right now. Like, that's, that's what we understand about the present. So we might spin the backstory. So think about, think about how, think about, think about how politicians take advantage of this longing that we have. 
So, like in 2016, the message was, make America great again. And what's that appealing to? It's appealing to this spin on the past that America once was great, but it's not now. That, that's what I want you to see. Like, like what, what, it's, what it's trying to get at in us is this, like, it's, America's not great now, but we can make it great again. Back in, um, back in 1984, uh, a time that I loved, the spin was, it's morning again in America. Anybody remember? It's morning again. That, 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 was, that was Ronald Reagan's uh, campaign line. It's morning again in America. There's that line again, or that word, again, again. Like, there were better mornings in the past. Well, the good news is, it's morning again, because that's what we're looking for. Like something to be right about our world again. So that's, that's spinning the past in a positive way. Uh, some politicians take advantage by spinning the past in a negative way. And so in 2008, the candidate talked about hope and change. You remember this, right? Hope and change. Change and hope. Hope and change. That was the mantra over and over and over again. Hope and, why would you talk about hope and change? Because things aren't good. Like, and, 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 and things like uh, things in the past weren't good. But there's hope. And, and, and we can change. Something better awaits us despite our past. Look, I'm, I'm not... I could be, but I'm really not uh, making political assertions here. I'm just trying to show you what our politicians appeal to in us. A recognition that the present is not what we want it to be. And so whether we spin the past through the lens of 1619 or we spin the past through the lens of 1776, both of them are telling us that there's something about the present that's not right. We all desire for something other than the world as it is now. Yes? We desire for something other than the world as it is now. And Jesus comes along and says, good news. Good news. Something other is here. It's the kingdom of God. Something other is here. That's really good news. If, if, if like you recognize, oh, that's, that is good. Because what's here right now, uh, this, this isn't good. Look, this is what I want you to recognize about our past. The past is not our hope. It doesn't even matter what you think of it. If you think our past is great, or if you think our past is ugly, it doesn't matter. The past is not our hope, and the past is not our condemnation. Look at verses 36 and 37. Now, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors, and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not decay. Like David... Whether you saw David's reign as great or, or sinful, it's irrelevant. Because the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. The past is neither our sentence nor our salvation. Look, some of you have a past, some of you have a past that you wish you could get back to. You wish you could get back to the past. Bruce Springsteen, anybody? Glory days? I, I, wanted, I wanted to play the music. Glory days. So glory days has these two great verses in it. One's about uh, a friend of, of his from high school who was an athlete. He was a, he was a baseball pitcher. Uh, 
he could throw that speed ball right by you. Uh, and, and he meets him in a bar, and all he could talk about was glory days, the days when I was a star athlete in high school. And then he talks about his neighbor, who uh, um, is a single mom, has two kids, was married, husband left her. But when she was in high school, she could turn the head of, of every boy. And, and, and that's all she could talk about were those high school days, gl glory days, glory days. I have, yeah, they'll, they'll pass you by. Glory days in the wink of a young girl's eye. I want to say, like, don't you get tired of living in the past. Don't you get tired of looking at the past as your best days or as our best days? Look, you, you know full well, like I'm, I'm, I'm a great baseball fan. Uh, I'm a great pirate fan. Um, but even I, even I. So this is what the pirates do right now when they don't win. Uh, they bring back players from past world championship teams. So like in, in 2021, they brought back the players from the 1971 World Series team. Look, uh, that's my boyhood team. I was 13. I knew every single one of those guys. I, I knew their number. I knew their name. I knew their position. I, I knew their batting average on a daily basis. Like these were my guys. I loved these guys. But 50 years later, you're parading them by me so that I can celebrate what happened 50 years ago? I'm tired of that. That's just baseball. But I'm tired of it. I'm tired of, of looking back on, on glory days as if those were the best days. I need some good news to say the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is, is here. I, 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 I don't want to keep looking back. Some of you have a past that is not a glorious past. Uh, some of you have a past you wish you could escape out of. Terrible things in your past. Terrible things that, that you perhaps did. Or, or terrible things that were done to you. And you feel locked in to your past. You feel condemned by your past. Let me say it again. Our past is not our salvation, nor is it our sentence. It's not our hope, nor is it our condemnation. God, God has been at work. In our past, in our backstories, God, God has been there. And he wasn't causing things to happen. Because we, we, we took that fruit off that tree so that we could make things happen our way. But God has been there nonetheless. Working in our lives, acting in our history, acting in your life. Preparing you perhaps for this, this very moment when you would surrender yourself to Jesus, when you would bring yourself to receive Jesus as your king. So last thing. The backstory, even though it doesn't define our present, the backstory is pregnant with promise. It is pregnant with promise. Look at these last verses, 32 and 33. Paul, we tell you the good news. This is the gospel. We tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors, all of that backstory has been full of promise. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled. That's the key word. That's the word to highlight. That's the word to circle. That's the word to underline. He has fulfilled for us. Their children, that is, our descendants, 
He is fulfilled for us by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second psalm, you are my son. Today I have become your father. So we're not going to go to Psalm 2, but what, all you need to know about this verse in relation to Psalm 2 is, Psalm 2 is a coronation psalm. Psalm 2 is about making the world's one true king the world's one true king. It is a psalm that points ahead toward Jesus. That's why, that's why, Paul, that's why Paul quotes it there. So maybe you had a son or a daughter or something, and, and uh, it was good news when they called you up and said, guess what? I'm pregnant. Like, I, 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 uh, I, I can remember a lot, but more, most recently, I, I can remember uh, Rachel. After being married for a year to Emmanuel, walking in, we were in Rwanda, and she walked into the house that Allison and I were staying in, and 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 she said, "Guess what?" And like, I don't even like, how do you know? You know these things? She said, "Guess what?" I said, "You are pregnant," and and she was. So that was good news. But you know, after you've heard that good news, if you get a phone call in month three of the pregnancy. And they say, hey, guess what? I'm pregnant. Oh, okay. And you get that phone call in month four or month five or month six or seven or eight. And so guess what? I'm pregnant. It's like, huh. Now, if you get that call in month 10, like, that's not good news. But you only, yeah, the good news, the news you're waiting for is, guess what? It's a girl. Guess what? That's the good news. Like nobody, I've never been pregnant for a day, but nobody wants to be pregnant for 10 years, right? Or how, however. The good news is when the promise is fulfilled, when there's, when, there's, when there's a delivery, that's the good news. How about, how about, how about one more, how about one more uh, baseball illusion? So, long-suffering pirate fans, here's the way it goes. We, we, we get told over and over, pirates have some of the top prospects in all of baseball. The pirates have one of the best farm systems in all of baseball. Do you know what? I, I, don't, I don't care anymore. Prospects, good farm systems. Uh, the good news would be the Pirates won the World Series. That unthinkable, isn't it? But that, that would be the good news. Not that we have prospects, but that we won. The backstory is pregnant with promise and and. Friends, the good news is the past has brought us to this present. Jesus, Jesus is king. Jesus is king. And for those of us allegiant to him, in this present moment, we are enacting his kingdom through the power of his spirit as we await his appearing with the new heaven and the new earth and his kingdom is fulfilled in all the earth. Amen. Like, that is good news. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would forgive us. I feel like what, what I need to repent of is that I ever thought that 
that I could make this world as it ought to be, or that I could make my world as it ought to be. But my past, my history shows that that's just not so. And so I repent that I ever thought that I could shape my own world. And as I repent of that, I pledge my fullest allegiance to you, Jesus, as my king. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, Jesus, send your spirit to us, us as a church, so that we might live the life of your kingdom in this present world, broken as it is, that they could see in us the world that you, that you desired. Help us, Lord Jesus. I pray, I do. I pray for, for men and women here, people watching, God, to whatever extent, to whatever extent we think our past is our salvation or to whatever extent we feel condemned by our past, oh God, free us from that so that we might enter into your kingdom present now. Help us, Lord Jesus.